Good morning, and welcome to the English service at Chinese Baptist Church of Coral Springs. We're so glad that you've joined us here. For those of you that are here in person with us, and we're so glad that you've tuned in online to our broadcast. Um, we just ask that you take a quick second to ready your heart for worship. So, would you take some time and just pray? Father God, we just come before you this morning, Lord, declaring that, Lord, we long to lift you high, to lift you high in our hearts, in our mind, with all of our strength, Lord. And God, we just want to put our eyes and our focus entirely on you, Lord, that we would run the race with endurance. And so, God, we ask that you would be with us here this morning in our service. We ask that you would meet us here in this building, that you would meet us in our homes with our families. Lord, that you would just open our ears and open our eyes to see and to understand your word, Lord, that we could glimpse you more and more clearly. We just thank you that we have this privilege to gather together in person and also online, Lord, to worship you. And so, Lord, we just ask that right now that your spirit, that your presence would be here, that it would be here in our midst, Lord, because all of this is in vain if you're not here with us. And so, God, we humbly ask that you would be here in our midst this morning. We pray this in your precious and in your holy name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word? Our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 4b to 6. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. And let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The word of the Lord.
bless his holy name. Oh, everything that's in me, bless his holy name. Everything that's in me, bless his holy name. Everything that's in me, bless his holy name. We sing. Oh, everything that's in me.
Oh, 
Heavenly Father, we come together this morning to proclaim that nothing but the blood of Jesus can redeem us from the wrath of God Lord, for our sins and our rebellion against him. Lord, your word says, though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, forgiven by the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for those who believe. Oh, Lord, we praise Jesus. He is the one who paid the debt. In this life, he raised us up to give us hope and security, to grant us forgiveness and a life of joy and freedom. Live by faith. Lord, for indeed we have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of Christ, where we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. We thank you, Lord, that we have been reconciled by Jesus' death and to be presented as holy and blameless and above reproach. So, Lord Jesus, paid it all, all to him we owe our gratitude and affections. So, Lord, this morning, open our hearts and minds that we may hear your words, your truths, and find life and strength to sing for joy in the midst of uncertainty and discouragement. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of worshiping together coming to you in prayer, acknowledging that you are our God. So to that end, we pray. Thank you for receiving our praise and prayers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles with you, our morning's sermon is from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 24 through 28. Colossians 1, starting from verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Well, we are thrilled this morning to welcome to our pulpit, Dr. Dono Minchu. Uh, Dr. Minchu has been a guest in our pulpit before. He currently serves as the director of the Gulfstream Baptist Association. This is a branch of the Southern Baptist Convention, which oversees and supports the Baptist churches in Broward County. Dr. Minchu has been a pastor in Florida churches and also has planted churches, but he served for many years uh, with the Southern Baptist International Missions Board and for over 10 years has served as representative in Africa and many countries there. So what a thrill it is to invite Pastor Minchu to our pulpit. His sermon title this morning is The Church That Loves Jesus, Dr. Minchu. It's a great privilege to be back with the uh, Chinese Baptist Church of Coral Springs. And uh, I know that circumstances of life have changed dramatically since the last time we were together. And we are now all together in uh, the midst of a worldwide pandemic and uh, seeking to find ways to worship together uh, and yet worship safely. And so, uh, again, privileged to be with you today. 
The Christian faith is a religion, but Christianity is not. Christianity is a movement that proceeds from Jesus the Christ. Fundamentally, the church is a love relationship with Jesus. He's demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemies, he died for us. Our response should be that we love him in return. And he has characterized for us what this love should look like. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, there's that, that question, do you really love me? If you love me, then you're going to act in a particular way. For Jesus, love is not a fuzzy feeling. For Jesus, it is not passionate worship with singing and emotion. For Jesus, love is obedience to what he asks. So the question is, what is the ultimate expression of love? What is the ultimate expression of obedience to Christ on the part of a church? In other words, how can you be a church that truly loves Jesus? Back in 1989, a book burst onto the bestseller list. Stephen Covey was a leadership specialist who codified what he had been reading and studying and researching into a book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think I got a first edition copy. For me, his second principle really resonated. Here's the second principle. Begin with the end in mind. In other words, you think all the way through to the end before you even begin. And doesn't this actually reaffirm the nature of who our God is? He tells us in Isaiah 46.10, I declare the end from the beginning. And from long ago, what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place and I will do all my will. And the King James, the writer of Hebrews says this about Jesus himself. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Father declares his point of reference based on seeing the end from the beginning. Our Lord looked out into the future and saw joy instead of agony. And now that he is seated at the right hand of God, he is writing our faith, which in his mind is already a finished product. He knows how it's all going to take place and how it is going to end. In God's church, we have a responsibility to do the same thing. We are to examine his revelation for markers of the finish and seek to make our current reality consistent with his vision, not with our own vision. We live in a strange time. Charles Dickens used the conditions of London and Paris around the time of the French Revolution to write a tale of two cities. He began the book by saying it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and that's where most people stop. But he goes on, he says, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, and it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We had all going, we were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. He just looks at the extremes. We live in a time in which much about the church has to do with the reactions of the world to life. The American church, particularly the evangelical expression of the church, is currently in the midst of being examined and being found wanting. The examination is being done by social pressure based on the social mores, the changing mores of American society. The church is not weathering the storm very well. The reason? Internally, we have become frail. We have accepted as valuable things that are not as seen as valuable by God. 
We have emphasized matters of style over matters of substance. Success in the modern American church has been judged in terms of commerce rather than in the terms of revelation. We have given great credence to those who have numerical and financial success instead of those who have great wisdom and have demonstrated great sacrifice for Christ. We have devised mission statements and purpose statements and strategic plans for growth, all drawn from the world of business rather than drawing our reality from God's revelation. In a mad quest to be seen as relevant by modern generations, we've actually moved the church to a place of irrelevancy. And I have no doubt, if you think about it, that you realize that American culture finds us irrelevant. If you do not believe me, I'll give you an experiment to prove my point. Take 48 hours to indulge completely in American culture. Don't listen to anything related to your church. Don't watch any videos that are related to anything that is going on. Don't listen to any worship music. But for 48 hours, just go out into popular culture. And it can be any dimensions. It can be sports. It can be news. It can be entertainment. It can be uh, music. It can be whatever you want it to be for those 48 hours. And then when the 48 hours are over... Tell me the number of times that you heard anything positive about Jesus Christ and about his revelation mentioned from within our culture. And you probably don't need a sheet of paper to write the number of times because we have become irrelevant to America. But that's not the point. Irrelevancy to America means nothing because relevancy is not based by means of perception. It is based on revelation of himself to a world that needs to hear him. The solution to our problem internally in God's church is to hear the implications of God's message. The destination verse today is the last of the verses that was read in the scripture passage. Here's that verse. We proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. We're going to verify how a church that loves Jesus is being obedient to the biblical revelation about the nature of the ministry of the church. But every destination has a beginning. We're going to get to the destination verse, but we've got to get back to the fundamental thing about why we proclaim him. And we find that as we look at the background of understanding God's purpose for the church from Colossians 1, 24 to 27. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And I am completing in my flesh, which is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The truth then, in a world that had never heard of Jesus Christ, is the same truth now in a world that finds Jesus Christ irrelevant. And it is that glorious mystery of Christ in us who is the hope of glory. Now notice within this passage there are three important aspects. First, within Christ's body, the church, the mandate is to make the word of God fully known. It's not done by half measures. It is done by preaching and teaching the whole counsel of God's word. It is a mystery that was hidden throughout the ages and throughout the generations. But now, notice this, it is revealed. It's not just given, it is not purchased, it is not done by course on the internet. It comes by revelation, and the only ones who have access to the revelation, hear me, are the saints. Those who have come into that special relationship with him. 
Now, as an individual, you may not follow me all the way to the end of this sermon today, but I want you to get this part. God reveals himself, and he does it through his word. And if you're going to know the reality of what this is all about, you have to know God and know him through the power of his word. It is not simply by mechanical thinking that this is done. You cannot become the kind of person that is described in this scripture passage by simply reading the Bible with your eyes, nor through your mind as an intellectual exercise, even though the mechanics of hearing or reading and the intellectual thing that is understanding is at play. No, this mystery is revealed in a progressive way. And it is revealed only to those who are devoted to Jesus Christ. And here's the other part. They're obedient to what they've already received. And it is that lack of obedience many times that keeps us from understanding the greater part of the mysteries. And we can say, oh, but I read the Bible. I study the Bible. We can make all kinds of excuses. But the point is, is that this is a spiritual exercise. Notice, too, God's plan did not only come to the chosen people, but he has been making this fully known to those who by heritage did not know him. Now, what was the result of the revelation? It is the glorious wealth of this mystery, Christ in you, where there is hope for glory. Every generation must decide what they place as authoritative for their lives. You are a refugee church by foundation in that the great majority of people who formed this church had come from China. But the majority of people who are part of the English ministry are not refugee. They were born here and they are part of this culture. You're going to find that you have ways of thinking that are different than your parents and your grandparents. You're going to find that your ways of thinking have a lot to do with uh, the generation that you're a part of. Paul affirms to the believers in Colossae that the glorious wealth of the mystery is Christ in them. And I want to say to you this. The church is fundamentally a place where Jesus Christ is acknowledged, hear me, as a living Lord, not a religious icon. Where Jesus is experienced in a real interior temple, so real that he is impossible to deny. We live in a generation where kids are coming up in church they're hearing truth. They're going through the routine and the motions. But according to the latest statistics, only 4% of evangelical young people continue in the faith once they leave their parents' home. There has been a massive fail of this revelation of a, li <coughs> Excuse me. Of a living Lord. Jesus is not merely of objective importance as the namesake of our faith. He is of subjective importance because he lives in us and in God's church, he lives among us. And it is only when we understand this and not only understand it, but experience it that we're equipped to move on to the central subject of the message of the church. And that's that key phrase in Colossians 1.28. We proclaim him. Emphasis there is not on the we. It is not on the verbal proclamation, but it is in the object of that verb. We proclaim him. We proclaim him because we know him personally and intimately. There is a watershed event for life. In this event, the transcendent God reveals himself from out in the realm of eternity and brings conviction to your heart that he is who the Bible says he is. 
Now, there's no set routine for this revelation. It happens for each individual in the same way. Now, the process is described the same. Every one of us was born. We know we, weren't, we were there. We don't remember it. Uh, our, our mothers may describe it for us. Our fathers may describe it for us. Families may describe it for us. We have a, license, uh, we have a certificate that says we were, but we know we were because we're here. But the circumstances of our birth was different for every one of us. And the circumstances of spiritual birth are different for every person. It can be a long persuasion. If you read the book, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis took decades to move through all of his thought processes until one day he described that he was surprised by joy. He woke up and he had embraced that truth and it had revolutionized his life and revolutionized his life for the rest of his life. It can be a quick life transforming event like it was for Beckett Cook. Beckett Cook 10 years ago was locked into a gay lifestyle that he had been in virtually since puberty. And in a coffee shop in Los Angeles, he asked some young people about what their church thought about him, and they were honest with him. And he decided to go to their church, and he dropped by, and that Sunday the Holy Spirit of God thundered from heaven and changed his life radically and completely. He'd never been in a sermon except that one time. But God chose to do that. The point is this. There is that moment when we know Him. When we know that we have passed from death into life and that the entire reality of our life has moved from all the other things we once counted on to knowing Him as the center and circumference of our life. A true church, a church that loves Jesus, is made up of people who have had this personal, transcendent experience. And our message collectively is this. We proclaim Him. We proclaim the one that we know. Now, what is the continuing methodology of the church? That's wrapped up in this verse also. It says, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom. We live in a day where positive reinforcement is the, the order of the day. It is the way we're supposed to do things, and it is not inconsistent with Christian faith. Still, there are things in life that must be taught by warning, not by experience. We warn our little ones about the danger of a hot stove because if they do something related to a hot stove by experience, it generally is a life-altering situation. We warn them about not touching animals that they don't know. We warn them about crossing highways and the danger of vehicles. And in the faith, my brothers and sisters, there are many reasons for warnings for those who are new in faith and those who are old in faith as well. Because listen to me, we have an active enemy. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. I don't know whether you've ever experienced a roaring lion. I've experienced them but I've experienced one of their brothers more. There's this little bitty wild cat in Africa, and it, uh, it prowls around villages. And I had gone out to show the Jesus film to uh, a village late one night and pitched a tent to sleep in and uh, get up the next morning and head back in. And so I'm in my tent, and it's about 3 in the morning when suddenly just beside my tent, one of those small cats growls. I came straight up. Never heard anything in my life like that. Don't want to hear it again. 
We have an enemy who prowls around, who is roaring. And I want you to understand about this, about that lion. He devours the careless. He devours the careless. There is a great scandal in God's church right now. One of the stalwarts of the Christian faith over the last 30 years has been found to have been involved in sexual sin for at least the last few years of his ministry. His name is Robbie Zacharias. The Robbie Zacharias ministry is right now running for cover, having to admit that he was indeed involved in these things and not knowing what to tell people. The reactions all over Christendom are everything from we have to pull his books off the shelves to uh, what about my salvation I received Jesus from his preaching. Listen to me. This is less scandal than it is spiritual reality. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter how long you've been at it. It doesn't matter how much truth you know or how much you, truth you have proclaimed. It doesn't matter where you think you are spiritually or where you actually have arrived. There is an enemy and his constant prowl is to take you down. And you need to be prepared within the midst of that to look to the author and finisher of your faith. You see, I just gave you a warning that's the kind of warning that we need within our process. But central to it is more than just warning. It's teaching. This is a specific word that is used many times in the New Testament that communicates the systematic conveyance of the truth of the New Testament faith. We have to help people build point upon point, precept upon precept, truth upon truth, and realize when they're not really getting it, where all they are doing is parroting with their mouth, they are not living out something that they have been able to internalize. You see, it is not simply done by human mechanics. No spiritual leader can ever stand before God and say, well, I taught them as if giving a course is enough. We have to be in constant monitoring to make sure that spiritual dynamic things are taking place with those who are part of our church. In Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 17, it says this, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The key there is, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In God's church, we warn and we teach with all wisdom praying that the spiritual exercise would be joined by the Holy Spirit enlightening the hearts of those who are part of the church. Now, in other messages, when I come back to see you, we're going to talk more about this process, but still the point is that the church matches its labor to the direction of the Lord of the church. We warn and we teach with all wisdom because the church has to have a destination. The destination of the church again, we're speaking of a church that loves Jesus, is that it puts him and his glory above all else and loves him more than everything else. It says that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Often ministry these days has settled for the maximum number of attenders as a mark of success. Or oh, we've salved our conscience by offering a few discipleship courses saying that we're really serious about the things of the gospel. But we cannot be the church of the living Lord without moving people along in their understanding and devotion to him until they actually reach maturity in Jesus Christ. That must be the goal of a church that loves Jesus. And listen to me, even though major responsibility in this, and we'll talk about this again more about this later, is in the hands of the pastor, it still has to be the objective of all those 
who have met him, all of those who know him, that they want the kind of church where every person reaches maturity in Jesus Christ. Mature believers are those who have come to understand so much of spiritual truth and reality that they stand openly and actively at the intersection between God and men. They actively represent the needs of men before God. And that's not just people in the church. That's people that they work with people that they meet out in business. They represent the needs of those people before God. But more than that, they represent God before them, unashamedly declaring to people that there is a God and that He cares and that He has answers to life. Sometimes it's not just people who don't know God at all. It is people who are weak in faith. And they don't need to hear some preacher stand up and say things. They need to hear the rank and file. They need to hear the mature believers in the church who are giving out truth about how to live in this world. Well, we come to the end of the message today. So I'll leave you with two questions. And they are questions for you as you internalize what you've heard. First, what kind of church are you, Chinese Baptists? If you're going to describe yourself, who are you? And then what kind of church do you want to be? My prayer is you want to be a church that loves Jesus. Father, we come before you this morning. Thank you for your word, its power, its reality. My prayer, Lord, is you would take these truths and make them sink deep into the lives of believers and that by your revelation, your word being made fully known, this would be a church that demonstrates its love for you by being a church that leads people to walk with you in maturity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Minshew, for sharing with us the Word of God this morning. And what a truly apt Word from God. We just ask that right now that you would stand with us as we respond and worship to our God.
Well, we're so glad you have joined us uh, this morning to worship together. Thank you, uh, praise team. And I just want to highlight a few items uh, for us this morning. The first is what a joy it is to see some new faces today physically. And you know, it's been for some, I think it's been about 10 months since we've actually physically come together. So the first thing we do is do, do, the, do the elbow bump. For us, that means a hug. A hug. And if you want to do a bear hug, that's two, two elbow bumps, all right? So what a joy it is. And I know we've, we've seen some of the younger folks here as well. And I think uh, they probably grew a couple of inches since the last time we, we saw them. So the first item, I want to just remind everyone the church is, uh, the church is open. And I want, you to encourage, I want to encourage you to go online. Uh, to the cbccs.org uh, webpage to get a link to sign up for church service. All right, there's still room. I know we've kind of made a, some guidelines to limit to about 10 families, 25 people as a whole, just, just to uh, watch and protect and be careful about our initial opening. So go online, all right, go online, uh, sign up, and we would love to see you and love to worship with you physically. For those who are online, we are so glad you're able to join us online as well. So continue that, and we love to continue our fellowship with you in that manner. The second item is the Young Adults Fellowship, the YAF, and the Agape are meeting on Friday nights. All right, uh, Ms. Heather wants me to highlight that. They are starting a new series focus, focusing on becoming disciple makers. So Young Adults, Agape, and those of you who would like to join that fellowship Friday night, all right? They would love to see you and have you be part of their fellowship. The, the third and last item I want to highlight is that the church council last Sunday approved the English Pastor Search Committee. And as we alluded to uh, several Sundays ago, we are starting a search for a new English pastor. That committee uh, is made up of Deacon uh, Tony, Deacon Samuel, and myself, along with, we're thrilled to have a couple of the English uh, members. Uh, the first is Brian New. So we're thrilled to have him. Brian has been involved both in the young adults, in the young couples, and as you know, in the music ministry. So we're thrilled to have his input and for you to provide input to him as we serve together. And the second uh, person is Karen uh, Wee, Karen uh, O-E-I. And she has served, uh, she's, uh, be, she's involved in LSEF. She has served in the youth uh, ministry and also currently in the children ministry. So what a thrill it, it is for us now to get together and as we move ahead to uh, do this work of a pastoral search. So a few things I encourage you to do now. What can you do as we transition in this period? And one is to pray. Continue to pray for the, for the process of our search that God would be honored through this. Pray um, for wisdom and discernment. Uh, pray individually, personally. Pray in small groups. Pray in your fellowship that God would truly lead our church in the English ministry in the direction that he desires. And thank you for God's word this morning. For what an apt reminder. We, we want a church that grows to be a mature church. And the second, second thing I want to remind all of us that stay connected. Stay connected to your fellowship group. None of us can do this alone. It is such 
uh, a hard and difficult task as we navigate the changes in this world, so much uncertainty and chaos, but we need one another. So stay connected with your fellowship groups, whether it's the young uh, adults, young couples, uh, LCEF, or if you have your prayer groups, accountability groups, stay connected, and we would encourage all of you to be part of some small group. And the third item is, is gather your thoughts, all right, and pray and write down your thoughts about the English ministry and, and the pastor. And we will stay tuned. We will have a chance to meet with uh, all of you to gather your thoughts and get input. So we're really excited. We're officially uh, meeting this, uh, this evening as the search committee. We're getting together church profile and looking at a list of the seminaries and job boards. All right, so stay tuned. And thank you so much that we're in this together. Uh, Lord bless you. Your Sunday today. 走在前线的宣教士，在各个工厂里给予当地人生命的陪伴，以及最直接的人道关怀。有些当地教师，有些帮忙开垦农地，提供生活或技能转移，有些给予心灵辅导。无论他们在世界的哪个角落，说着哪一国的语言，他们都携带同一个使命，就是期望人们认识并相信主耶稣。认识真理。一般有拆船负担的牧者同工，齐心合意为华人教会前方的拆船路向上帝祷告，决定组成拆会。一九九五年四月二十五日，得到美国加州政府的批准，成立非牟利机构——华人福音普世拆船会。划船因而诞生。一九九五年，开创期的划船在黄存旺牧师家里开始做办公室，后来于两千年迁至圣布努诺 （San Bruno） 成立划船总部。鉴于工厂和需要增多，划船接续在全球各地建立起各地办事处，集结成网。更有效地招募与培训宣教师，推展施工。二十五年来，划船在全世界开拓了将近三十个工厂，至今先后有五位国际总主任：郑果牧师、黄存旺牧师、林安国牧师、于俊全牧师、冯永良牧师。他们在不同的时间站定岗位，尽忠职守，如领头羊一般，带领前后方的宣教师，共同回应大使命。划船回应世界福音的呼声及需求，计划与方针必须更加积极主动。二零一八年，划船在泰国清迈购买两万五千六百平方米的土地，新建泰国宣教中心，借此福音中心进行社区关怀服务、宣教训练、营会及宣教师的关怀。在世界的另一端，划船在非洲明珠的首都坎帕拉。开始建造划船宣教中心基地。我们期望乌干达的宣教中心提供训练装备、住宿、餐饮和事工参与的多元平台，从而达到装备个人、服侍社群、成全教会的多赢目标。划船走过四分之一世纪，但世界的呼声及福音的需要，使我们不敢松懈、停下脚步。未来，我们继续期许一个华人与万民同德福的愿景。我们要兴起下一代，推动英语和西班牙语的宣教事工。除了泰国清迈宣教中心、非洲乌干达宣教中心，划船也期望开展黎巴嫩事工及拉丁美洲事工。此外，我们也在祷告中探讨开拓更多新工厂。时代的步伐飞速，工厂的挑战也越来越大。我们能理解宣教士所面对的种种困难、孤单、无助。所以，划船想投资在宣教士关顾，同时准备和全球不同的机构和种族携手合作。今天，划船前后方的宣教士将近两百人，但要收的庄稼多，做工的人少。我们需要，这世界需要更多愿意为主兴起、背上十字架的宣教士。划船举办过四届青年宣教营。二零一八年，更将营地迁入泰国清迈工厂，让他们贴近工厂的需要及体会神的心意，同时也让他们和宣教士有零距离的接触。清宣营就如一个孕育宣教士的暖房。清宣大会曾协助超过七十人找到命定，走上宣教合场。
，华传要诚心邀请您加入，献上自己或您的祷告或金钱奉献，和我们一同奔向世界各个角落，将福音传到地极。Father, we come before you today, and we say with great faith and great confidence that we do not live in uncertain times. We live in certain times that are controlled by you. And Lord, we should find humorous that in this fallen world, you have allowed one little virus to throw every system that man has into disarray and a disorder. And that our security on this day does not rest in the fact that there are multiple vaccines that are finally being found. Our security does not rest in the fact that the economy has seemed to have stabilized somewhat. Our security is not in anything from an earthly perspective. It is the fact that you are the one that we look to, and we have confidence, Lord, that you're going to bring this about. To honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that we would be watching to see Your hand. We would be watching to understand Your devices, and that God, in these uncertain terms, as far as the world is concerned, You would allow us to walk with certainty, with love, and with joy, and that we might, as a result, share the one that we talked about today, that we might proclaim Him. For we pray in the Lord's name, the Lord Jesus, Amen.